Last time we looked at Hegel's analysis of the importance of Socrates for Greek culture and for world history. Kierhardt studied Hegel's text carefully, and in the concept of irony, he responds to it almost point for point. Our goal for the lecture today is to have a look at Kierhardt's understanding of Socrates and to see where he agrees with Hegel and where he disagrees. We'll have a look at Kierhardt's analysis of Socrates' daimon the trial and conviction of Socrates, the relation of Socrates to the sophists and to the later schools of philosophy. We'll also see that Kierhoff was quite exercised by Hans Lassen Martinson in his lectures at the University of Copenhagen. Today, we'll explore Kierhoff's response to Martinson's article on Faust and Kierhoff's two satirical works that were aimed at Martinson and his students, namely, the concept between the old and the new soap sellers, and Johannes Climacus, or De Omnibus Dubitandum Est. Finally, we also want to introduce a lesser known Danish figure, Andreas Frederik Beck, who wrote the first book review of the concept of irony. This review is insightful in many ways. It gives us a brief snapshot into the contemporary assessment of the work, and we can also gain some insight into Kihord's view of it when we see his negative reaction to Beck's comments. Kierhardt agrees with Hegel's understanding of the daimon as a part of Socrates' subjectivity that's opposed to the traditional values and customary ethics of Athens. Along these same lines, he also agrees with Hegel in seeing the daimon as a private pendant to the public oracle that the Greeks revered. Kierhardt points out a discrepancy in the account of the daimon in the ancient sources. According to Plato, the daimon was something purely negative, it warned Socrates not to do certain things, but it never proposed or demanded positive actions. By contrast, according to Xenophon's account, the daimon was not just negative, but also positive, prompting and enjoining Socrates to do specific things. Kierhard was thus obliged to make some kind of judgment about which of the ancient sources to follow on this point, and here he wholeheartedly affirms the view of Plato. He believes that Socrates is fundamentally a negative figure, and thus it's a confusion when one wants to ascribe something positive to him. This is important to Kihort since he wants to see Socrates' irony as his defining characteristic. Irony is, in its essence, negative or destructive. It negates and criticizes various elements of the established order. Kihort believes that Xenophon does not properly grasp this important negative mission of Socrates, and for this reason, he mistakenly attributes something positive to Socrates' daimon. By contrast, Plato was the more perceptive student who recognized the importance of the negative element in Socrates. When Kierhard was growing up, the tragic drama Faust by the famous German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was a very famous and much discussed work. When he was studying at the University of Copenhagen, Kierhard became very interested in this story and in the figure of Faust. In 1836, in his journal BB, he made a bibliography of different interpretations of Goethe's work and of the Faust legend generally. Kierhard was clearly planning to write something about Faust, perhaps an article or perhaps a monograph. Perhaps he even thought it might be a possible topic for his master's thesis. In any case, he became very upset when, in June of 1837, Hans Lassen Martinson published an article in the first issue of the academic journal Perseus entitled 
observations on the idea of Faust with reference to Leno's Faust. When he heard about this, Cured became very upset and wrote in his journal, oh, how unlucky I am. Martinson has written a treatment of Leno's Faust. Why was Cured so upset about this? Why was he so interested in the figure of Faust in the first place? The answer to these questions becomes clear when we take a brief look at Martinson's article. Instead of treating Goethe's well-known version of Faust, Martinson chose instead to treat a version written by the Austro-Hungarian poet Nimbes von Strimblenau, who wrote under the pseudonym Nicholas Lenau. On his journey, Martinson had met Lenau personally in Vienna and became interested in his work. Martinson saw in the figure of Faust, as portrayed by Leno, a representative of the modern world. In his dissertation on the autonomy of human self-consciousness, Martinson examined the concept of autonomy, that is, the idea that humans could act on their own and determine the truth by themselves. He regarded this as a widespread and dangerous tendency in modern thought that led away from Christian belief. The figure of Faust represents exactly this principle. He's the symbol of modern secular knowledge. Faust embodies, quote, the deep feeling of the corruption of the human will, its desire to transgress the divine law, its arrogant striving to seek its center in itself instead of in God. According to the Christian view, humans are by nature sinful and ignorant. They can know nothing without the help of God. It's thus only human pride and arrogance that believes it can discover the truth on its own. Faust thus believes he has no use for God or Christianity since he can discover the truth himself by means of secular scientific knowing. He writes, Faust, quote, represents the human race's striving to ground a realm of intelligence without God. Faust also represents the principle of doubt. What cannot be demonstrated by the tools of science must be the subject to skepticism, and this includes the doctrines of religion. This view rejects traditional beliefs and exposes everything to its merciless skepticism. This, however, leads Faust to despair, and he becomes separated and alienated from society and accepted ethics. Martinson thus portrays Faust as the model for the ills of the modern world. Kierhard's reaction to the publication of Martinson's article can be explained by the fact that he too was interested in seeing Faust as a paradigmatic example of modern existence and Martinson had anticipated his assessment of the nature of the modern age. Kierkegaard was interested in Faust for the same reason that he was interested in Socrates. They were both negative figures who called into question traditional beliefs and values. Both Socrates and Faust believed that the critical reasoning of each individual must decide the truth of the matter. Socrates reduces people to aporia and ends with a negative conclusion, just as Faust's skepticism leads him to despair. Kierkegaard's attentive to the fact that both Socrates and Faust represent something at the heart of the modern spirit. Kierkegaard draws this parallel explicitly in his journal AA from the year 1837 when Martinson published his article. He writes, I quote, Faust may be seen as parallel to Socrates, for just as the latter expresses the severing of the individual from the state, so Faust, after the abrogation of the church, depicts the individual severed from its guidance and left to itself. Both Faust and Socrates represent an emphasis on the individual at the cost of a larger institution or aspect of the objective world. Kierkegaard addresses the same question that Hegel did about the assessment of the condemnation of Socrates. Like Hegel, he's critical of what he calls the scholarly professional mourners in the crowd of shallow but lachrymose humanitarians, who regard Socrates as an honest and righteous man who is unfairly persecuted by the rabble. Also in agreement with Hegel, Kierkegaard sees the daimon of Socrates as something that clearly puts him at odds with the traditional religion. With regard to the question of whether Socrates was an atheist who rejected the gods of the state, Kierkegaard claims that this was based on a misunderstanding. This was a typical charge leveled against ancient Greek philosophers like Anaxagoras, who were interested in exploring the phenomena of nature. 
The Greek gods were conceived as closely related to the natural forces, for example, Zeus with lightning and Poseidon with the sea and with earthquakes. When the early Greek philosophers took it upon themselves to study nature, they distinguished themselves from the religious tradition that sees the gods as causal agents in nature. The early Greek philosophers developed the rudiments of what we know today as the natural sciences by trying to understand the phenomena of nature without the agency of the gods. Since they didn't make any appeal to the gods in their explanations of the natural world, there arose the suspicion that they didn't believe in the gods at all, and thus were atheists. Kihor points out that this is a misunderstanding, since Socrates was never interested in the investigation of the natural scientific phenomena, and thus it's a mistake to associate him with these early Greek philosophers. Kihor goes on to explain that the charge of atheism can best be understood in connection with Socrates' well-known claim to ignorance. In other words, when Socrates claimed to know nothing, this was mistakenly taken to mean that he knew nothing about the gods worshipped by the state. But this was, of course, not the point of Socrates' self-proclaimed ignorance. He clearly knew many empirical things about the world around him, but he claimed not to know the universals and was constantly trying to get people to formulate clear definitions of them. What is piety? What is justice? What is beauty? Kierhard claims that an important element in the condemnation of Socrates was, that was what was regarded as his attempt to alienate individuals from the state. He brings this into connection with the famous maxim, know yourself. According to Kierhard, Socrates' understanding of this command was that each individual should seek the truth in him or herself. But this meant turning away from the world of objective truth, which included traditional ethics and religion. Kierhard explains, quote, a phrase know yourself means separate yourself from the other. So the individual is thus alienated from other individuals in society, since after the Socratic interrogation, it's impossible to continue to maintain the traditional values and customs as before. By means of his calling everything into question, Socrates destroys the individual's belief in all the things that hold society together. This is, according to Kierhard, rightly regarded as a dangerous matter. Quote, it's obvious that Socrates was in conflict with the view of the state, indeed, that from the viewpoint of the state, his offensive had to be considered most dangerous, as an attempt to suck its blood and to reduce it to a shadow. Now, given this, Kierhard agrees with Hegel that the Athenian state was justified in condemning Socrates, since he was in fact a revolutionary figure who was undermining the foundation of the state. But it should be noted that he was not revolutionary in the sense that he was forming a specific political party or a positive platform. Rather, his mission was purely negative. He separated individuals from the state and isolated them from one another by undermining their accepted beliefs in custom and tradition. He called each individual to withdraw into him or herself and to find the truth there. At the end of the chapter, The Actualization of the View, Kierhard gives an assessment of the last part of Socrates' trial, where he proposes his alternative punishment. Kierhard draws attention to the fact that, in the Apology, Socrates makes a lot out of the specific number of people who voted for his acquittal and his condemnation. By doing this, Socrates regards the jury not as a collective whole, or as the Athenian state as such, but rather as individuals. Each of them individually made a decision and cast his vote. Socrates thus recognizes the importance of the subjectivity of individuality of each person, but he refuses to recognize the authority of the abstract state or the collective whole. Here, Kierhard's in agreement with Hegel's account, which sees Socrates' condemnation as being the result of his refusal to accept the legitimacy of the court. Kierhard explains, I quote, the objective power of the state, 
its claims upon the activity of the individual, the laws, the courts, everything loses its absolute validity for him. Quixote sees Socrates as occupying a position of complete negativity towards the state. Socrates accepts the truth and validity of each single individual, but refuses to accept it in any collective group, the state, the jury, a political party, etc. Such groups undermine one's individuality and reduce people to the common mean. This view alienates Socrates from his fellow Athenians and is regarded as a real and serious threat to the state. Much of Athenian society was built upon principles of community and democracy, and thus to call this into question was very alarming for most people. So according to this interpretation, the great menace to Greek society came not from the mighty forces of the Persian Empire, but rather from an impoverished old man. The tool used to undermine the Athenian state was not great armies or engines of war, but rather irony. Irony was a negative force that spared nothing in its path. The most sacred and time-honored institutions of the Athenians were at grave risk. We've seen that Kierhard was irritated by the fact that Martinson was having such great success uh, with the students at the University of Copenhagen, and that Martinson, like Kierhard, was interested in the figure of Faust. One important aspect of Martinson's thought was his characterization of modern philosophy as beginning with the principle of doubt. While ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy were uncritical and based their views on faith, modern philosophy that began with Descartes realized that it was necessary to begin from the ground up by doubting everything. Descartes realizes that many of the things that he and other people take to be true in fact prove to be mistaken under closer scrutiny. This means that many of the things that we think we know are based upon shaky foundations. In his meditations on first philosophy, Descartes begins by making the attempt to doubt absolutely everything that he has ever been taught or known so that he can attempt to determine from the start up what can firmly be established as true. Martinson seizes upon this image of Descartes as applying systematic method of doubt as a model for modern philosophical thought. He takes the Latin phrase from Descartes' text to capture this, de omnibus dubitandum est, or one must doubt everything. Martinson uses this phrase repeatedly and it became a sort of shorthand slogan among his students. It seemed to be not just the characterization for a period of modern philosophy in contrast to earlier periods, but also a call to arms for modern thinkers to apply Descartes' skeptical method. Clearly, this set of issues that Martinson addresses is closely related to the issues that Kuhort finds in Socrates, who questions his fellow countrymen and calls their accepted views into doubt. Descartes doesn't want to stop once, until everything has been called into question, just as Socrates doesn't wish to stop until he's gained a satisfactory answer to his questions. Kihord wrote two satirical works about Martinson and his students that he never published. Both of them take the issue of Descartes' universal doubt as a central motif. The first of these works is a student comedy entitled The Conflict Between the Old and the New Soap Sellers, which Kihord wrote in his journal D.D., probably in the first months of 1838 when he was still a student. The inspiration for this piece came from this square here in Copenhagen, where during Kierhort's time, there were rival shops that sold soap. There was an old established shop that was located here in the basement of this building in Grobroller Tor 3. This was an old soap cellar, and then one day a new shop moved in that became its rival. This was the new soap cellar. In order to avoid losing business, the old soap cellar put up a sign to indicate that this shop was the old traditional soap cellar. This was an amusing rivalry that caught Kihort's attention. It will be recalled that at his trial, Socrates proposed as his penalty that he would be maintained at public expense and that he could take free meals at the Pritaneum. This was a public building in Athens, a kind of town hall where people who had done great deeds for the state, for example, victorious Olympian athletes, would receive free meals at the expense of the state. In his satire, Kihort uses this idea, but instead of placing Socrates in the Pritaneum, as Socrates himself requested, Kuhard places Martinson and his students there. Kuhard creates a handful of amusing characters who engage in absurd philosophical conversations. They're constantly using slogans such as 
de omnibus dubitandum est that everybody knew from Martinson's lectures and written works. In Act Two of this comedy, Kjord creates the absurd situation of placing these comic philosophers in the Prytaneum, the implications that they, like Socrates, are providing some important public service with their philosophizing and with their attempt to doubt everything. But instead of doing anything meaningful, they simply engaged in confused and absurd philosophical conversation, all the while taking themselves very seriously. Kjord here seems clearly to be making fun of Martinson and his students in their sense of self-importance in their attempt to begin, as Descartes did, with universal doubt. Now, what's interesting here when we consider this work as a satire on Martinson and his students was that Martinson himself, during this time, lived in a house just opposite the soap cellars. <laughs> right? right in the 1837, that is, when Kjord was a student, when he wrote the comedy, The Soap Cellars, Kjord himself moved into an apartment that stood at the corner of Lowestreet, that is, Lowestreet and Niels Hemmingsen's Gita, just across from Martinson's apartment. The other satirical work that Kierkegaard wrote but never published makes direct use of Martinson's slogan. It's entitled Johannes Climacus or De Omnibus Dubitandum Est. Johannes Climacus is the name of Kierkegaard uses as the pseudonymous author of the work's philosophical fragments and the concluding unscientific postscript. But this satirical text was apparently written at some point in 1843 before these two well-known pseudonymous books. Johannes Climacus is the name that Kierkegaard uses as the pseudonymous author of the work's philosophical fragments and the concluding unscientific postscript. But this satirical text was apparently written at some point in 1843 before these two well-known pseudonymous books. De Omnibus tells the story of a young student named Johannes Climacus. He attends lectures here in one of the lecture halls at the University of Copenhagen and becomes interested in the philosophical discussions about the need to begin by doubting everything. Clearly, Kihort intends Climacus to represent one of Martinson's students who's caught up in the flurry of interest surrounding Martinson's lectures. Much of the text is filled with a series of philosophical deliberations in which Johannes tries to determine exactly what is meant with the demand that one doubt everything in philosophy. There are three different variants of this uh, that he explores in turn. First, philosophy begins with doubt. Second, in order to philosophize, one must have doubted. And third, modern philosophy begins with doubt. In each case, he ends up in absurdities. Although Kierkegaard never finished this work and it breaks off in the middle, the plot was apparently intended to end by showing how Johannes was reduced to despair in his attempt to follow the imperative of doubting everything. In a note, Kierkegaard explains the plan for the work that he never realized. He writes, Johannes does what we are told to do. He actually doubts everything. He suffers through all the pain of doing that. When he's gone as far in that direction as he can go and wants to come back, he cannot do so. Now he despairs. His life is wasted. His youth is spent in these deliberations. Life has not acquired any meaning for him, and all this is the fault of philosophy. So the point seems to be that philosophy can have a negative, seductive effect on young people. Martinson has irresponsibly enjoined the students to doubt everything, but this would also involve doubting things such as one's religion, one's relations to family, community, and so forth. When one begins to doubt these things, then one isolates oneself. While it was intended as a kind of academic exercise, these young students take it seriously as a way of life and thereby come to undermine their own beliefs. But once one has reached this point, it's impossible to go back. Once one has begun the process of critical reflection, it's impossible to return and live in the uncritical intimacy of one's formal beliefs. This is the view that is suspicious of new knowledge, fearful of what it might bring. As was the case with Socrates, it separates the individual from their family and community. The conclusion of Kierkegaard's story is that Johannes ends in despair. He's destroyed by philosophical doubt. Kierkegaard agrees with Hegel's characterization of Socrates as a turning point in history. He proposes his own evaluation of this by analyzing first the relation of Socrates to the movement of, of the sophists 
which preceded him, and then his relation to the different schools of philosophy that came after him. By seeing Socrates between these two poles, we can come to a better understanding of his role as a turning point in the development of Greek thought and culture. The cause of the downfall of Greek life was what Kierkegaard, following Hegel, characterizes as the arbitrariness of finite subjectivity. This is associated with the sophists who are known for their relativism. He explains, quote, the sophists represent knowledge separating itself into its motley multiplicity from substantial morality by means of the awakening reflection. On the whole, they represented the separated culture for which a need was felt by everyone for whom the fascination of immediacy had faded away. Like Socrates, the sophists also subjected to doubt and criticism, accepted custom and tradition, or what is called here substantial morality. They represented a separation or alienation from the traditional Greek culture. The sophists claimed to teach a practical knowledge that would be beneficial to young men in politics and business. Specifically, they taught the art of speaking and argumentation, by means of which they could make an effective case for whatever they perceived to be to their advantage at the moment. But this argumentation was always in the interest of the one doing the arguing, and not in the interest of any higher truth, since that truth is exactly what the sophists denied. So there's both something negative and something positive about this procedure. The negative aspect says that there's no absolute truth, and the truths of traditional custom, morality, and ethics are, in fact, illusory, having no firm foundation. Given that there is no absolute truth, there is only an arbitrary or contingent truth, which is dictated by the self-interest of the individual. So the sophists elevate these contingent, arbitrary truths to something important, and their promise is to teach how to pursue this. Given that there are no absolute truths, the sophists thus enjoin people to revel in the contingent ones for as long as it serves their purposes. Kierkegaard explains this as follows. Quote, in its first form, this education offered by the sophists shakes the foundation of everything, but in its second form, it enables every pupil of integrity to make everything firm and fast again. The sophist, therefore, demonstrates that everything is true. The sophist can thus give reasons and arguments for anything at all. It is in this sense that we still use the word sophist today. We say, for example, that someone is a sophist who tries to justify blatantly wrongful behavior by means of specious reasoning. One of the things that bothered Kierkegaard about Martinson was the fact that he pretended to assume a posture of radical, disabused skepticism with his well-known claim, de omnibus dubitandum est. But this was only an empty slogan. Martinson's point was, like that of Descartes, to emerge from the skepticism and begin to establish something positive, a doctrine, an argument, or a foundational truth claim. This was exactly the way that Kierkegaard describes the sophists, as we just saw. They shake the foundations of everything, but then they make everything firm again. For Kierkegaard, the profundity and genius of Socrates is to be found in the fact that he remains in the skepticism and negativity and refuses to be drawn into the construction of a positive truth claim. Kierkegaard contrasts Socrates with the sophists by claiming that Socrates is purely negative, whereas the sophists teach positive doctrines. For example, Protagoras claims to know what virtue is and to be able to teach it. By contrast, Socrates claims not to know what it is and claims it cannot be taught. Kierkegaard concludes from this analysis, quote, irony has a world historical validity. In other words, it's valid for Socrates to use irony in the given historical situation. His irony was aimed against two targets. First, the unreflective proponents of traditional Athenian life, and second, the self-assured sophists who were making various unfounded positive claims. With respect to the former, Traditional values and ethics were falling into decay, and it was historically valid that these be taken up by critical reflection at the time. With respect to the latter, 
It was valid that Socrates tried to confront the sophist and expose the shallowness of their relativism. These were two important aspects of Greek life at the time, and Socrates, with his irony, plays a key historical role in this context. He's not employing irony just to be flippant or to irritate or impress someone. Rather, his use of irony was dictated by the times. By Kierkegaard's time, it had become a standard motif to compare Socrates and his fate with Christ. Both were ethically righteous individuals, and both had been persecuted in legal proceedings and executed. There was a body of literature on this comparison, which Kierkegaard was familiar with. One of the most important of these was the work of the theologian Ferdinand Christian Bauer, entitled Das Christliche des Platonismus oder Socrates und Christus, that is, on Christianity and Platonism, Socrates and Christ, from 1837. Kierkegaard refers to this work repeatedly in the concept of irony. In the New Testament, Christ is portrayed as struggling with the scribes and teachers of the law, known as the Pharisees, who insisted on strict observance of religious ceremonies and practices. In comparative studies, like that of Bauer, a parallel was often drawn with Christ's conflict with the Pharisees and Socrates' conflict with the Sophists. Kierkegaard makes this connection when he says, quote, the Sophists are reminiscent of the Pharisees. This gives us an important insight into the significance of Socrates for Kierkegaard. Initially, it was not clear why he would be so interested in Socrates, a pagan philosopher, if his primary goals had something to do with a specific understanding and appreciation of Christianity. Here we see the connection. Socrates is like Christ and the sophists are like the Pharisees. So, although Socrates is a pagan philosopher, he displays some important points of commonality with the message of Christ that Kierkegaard believes has been forgotten. Thus, by making use of some of Socrates' ideas and methods, Kierkegaard believes that he can bring some insight into what he takes to be the confused understanding of Christianity in his own day. An important figure in Kierkegaard's time was a man named Andreas Frederick Beck, who was a student at the University of Copenhagen at the same time as Kierkegaard. He was influenced by the German theologian David Friedrich Strauss, who had been a student of Hegel in Berlin. Strauss was well known for his monumental study entitled The Life of Jesus Critically Examined from 1835 to 1836. This work was controversial in the German-speaking world since it examined the gospel texts in great detail and tried to argue that the stories related about Jesus were by and large myths. Indeed, the work cost Strauss his position at the University of Tübingen. Later, in 1839, after it was thought that the controversy had died down, Strauss was appointed to a position at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, but when this was made public, it evoked such large protests that the university couldn't go through with the appointment. Beck was interested in bringing Strauss's approach to Denmark. At the time of Kierkegaard's dissertation in 1841, Beck was working on a book entitled The Concept of Myth or The Form of Religious Spirit, which would be published the next year. As a student, Beck lived here in Borks College, one of the old colleges of the University of Copenhagen. Beck knew Kierkegaard personally and was keenly interested in the concept of irony. During the public defense of a dissertation, it was possible for people from the audience to ask questions about the work, and Beck was one of these questioners. The following year, Beck wrote a review of the concept of irony, which appeared in the periodical The Fatherland. We're joined today by Professor Brian Soderquist, one of the leading international experts for the early Kierkegaard. What was Beck's interest in Kierkegaard's work? <laughs> 
We're joined here today by Professor Brian Soderquist, one of the leading international experts for the young Kierkegaard. And so, yeah, what was Beck's interest in Kierkegaard's work? Well, Beck was especially interested in Kierkegaard's methodology and the concept of irony, uh, especially that aspect where Kierkegaard tries to locate the historical Socrates, the Socrates who isn't just the uh, creation of Plato, Xenophon, or Aristophanes, but the man, the historical person behind those different witnesses. Today, we recognize the, the concept of irony as an important work for our understanding of the modern world, but at the time, it was met with a degree of skepticism. Indeed, all five members of Kierkegaard's dissertation committee, they complained that the work suffered from some pretty serious flaws. And in fact, the tone of their official statements about it makes it sound as if they were only rather reluctant even to pass the work as a master's thesis. In fact, they would rather have liked to have seen some revisions. But when Beck reviewed the work, however, he, he, seemed to be, he seemed to see something more in it. He seemed to be quite positive. What was it, do you think, that Beck saw in the work that other people were blind to? Well, Beck wrote a fantastic review of the concept of irony and really went into some of the details. Uh, and one of the things that Beck liked more than anything was precisely that methodology because it looked a lot like what Beck was working on at the time, namely the attempt to isolate the historical Jesus from the different gospel accounts of Jesus. And he could see that Kierkegaard was doing something similar with Socrates to try to get at the historical person behind the mythological person, so to speak. And what was Kierkegaard's response to this review? Well, strangely, even though Beck's review was, was, was positive and, and really uh, complimented Kierkegaard back and forth, and was in fact a very accurate review, uh, Beck added a single line at the very end of the review where he said something to the effect that he, like others reading the dissertation, uh, had a hard time following a few of the, 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 the lines. And of course, it's a very reasonable uh, thing to say for anyone who's read Kierkegaard's uh, dissertation because there are a lot of places that are a little bit hard to understand. But of course, Kierkegaard reacted with disdain to that last line. He ignored that positive review and seized upon those last words where Beck accused him of saying something that was a little bit hard to understand. And Kierkegaard very sarcastically and ironically responded publicly by saying, uh, should it really be my fault that a reader doesn't understand what I've written? Shouldn't it really be his problem? And that's something we find in almost all of Kierkegaard's reactions to any reviews of any of his works a real disdain because something that Kierkegaard didn't like was a reviewer, precisely because when somebody acts as a reviewer, there's an implicit power structure here. The reviewer stands there as somebody who thinks they're in a position to judge that work. And that's what Kierkegaard didn't like. He didn't like boys judging his work. And, and what text is it that Kierkegaard responds to, to Beck's work specifically? Yeah, Kierkegaard responded, uh, first of all, to Beck's review of the concept of irony. And uh, later on in his career, Beck wrote another review of another work. And uh, in that work, Kierkegaard was equally dismissive, this time accusing Beck of not understanding the nuance of his irony, giving a very clear account of the dialectical, that is, the philosophical content, but failing to note how ironic that whole work was. So in Kierkegaard's article in, in response to, to Beck's review called Public Confession, so in your opinion, he, he doesn't really uh, enter into any academic exchange with, with Beck's actual comments about the concept of irony. No, he doesn't. He really do ignores Beck's substantive critique. And this is really very consistent with what we find in other Kierkegaardian responses to reviews. He ignores almost entirely any kind of substantive philosophical or theological debate and gets right at some kind of ironic or sarcastic uh, response. And uh, I think in that sense, we, we, we see some of the tensions between Kierkegaard and uh, his, his, his contemporaries. And we really see that Kierkegaard wasn't interested in an academic debate about his thought. 
Kierkegaard then addresses the other side of the idea of Socrates as a turning point, namely his legacy. Socrates gave rise to a number of different and often competing schools of philosophy in antiquity. Kierkegaard raises the question of how so many very different views could all claim to have their origin in the thought of Socrates. One might be tempted to think that his legacy is due to the fact that he had many different kinds of doctrines that were attractive to different philosophical directions. However, Kierkegaard claims that the fact of Socrates' heterogeneous legacy provides further evidence for his claim that Socrates represents pure negativity. If Socrates had had a positive doctrine with a handful of constructive theses, then these would have been attractive to some people but unattractive to others. But the positive nature of his views would invariably have had a limiting effect on potential followers. But, Kihort argues, precisely because he had no positive doctrine, there was no limiting effect, and people were free to see in his thought anything that they wished. Socrates could thus be readily co-opted into whatever views the given philosophical school wished to promote. Thus, while Socrates gave rise to a number of philosophical schools with different positive doctrines, he himself represents what Kierkegaard, following Hegel, calls infinite negativity. Kierkegaard concludes the chapter by re-emphasizing his thesis that Socrates used irony as a negative tool both against established uh, Greek society, which meant its ethics, customs, traditions, etc., and against the sophists with their relativism. According to Kierkegaard, the enduring feature of Socrates is as a negative figure. If there were something positive in his philosophizing, then he would have been much less interesting and important. After reading the text and watching this lesson, some of you might think that Kierkegaard's understanding of Socrates is mildly interesting or that his satire of Martensen is a little bit funny, but you might be asking yourself how any of this is relevant for you in your lives today. Who cares if Kierkegaard agreed with Hegel that the Athenians were justified in prosecuting Socrates? Who cares that Kierkegaard mocked a lecturer at the University of Copenhagen in the late 1830s? Aren't these just issues for professional philosophers or historians of ideas? I would like to suggest that there's something very important about this set of issues that, in fact, is highly relevant for our world today. We've been talking about knowledge and doubt and traditional values, and what many of these issues boil down to is a fundamental question about the nature and status of knowledge and its role in human life. This is one of the oldest questions in all of human history. Indeed, one can see it in one of the most ancient stories that has come down to us, the story of the fall and Genesis in the Old Testament. What does that story say? We're told that the first human beings, Adam and Eve, lived in a wonderful garden, which provided them with everything they required to satisfy their needs. They're at home in the universe. They're in harmony with nature and with the world around them. But there's one thing they don't have, knowledge. They live in a kind of ignorant bliss. God tells them that they can enjoy everything that they like in the garden, but they may not eat from the tree of knowledge. As we know, according to the story, Adam and Eve, seduced by the snake, defy this prohibition eat from the tree, and thus gain knowledge. Suddenly, everything changes. They see the world with different eyes, and for the first time, they realize they're naked. For the first time, they feel shame. Now, they're no longer in harmony with the world. Instead of being at home in the garden, they're now alienated from it. When God disco discovers this, he punishes Adam and Eve for breaking his command and he sends them out of the garden and into the wild, wider world, which, is, which, as is written, is called East of Eden. What the story tells us is that knowledge is a dangerous thing. God knew this all along, and for this reason, he told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree. God knew that knowledge ends in shame, fear, and alienation. Once human beings have taken this step, they can never go back. The moral to the story is that human beings are not meant to have knowledge. They're happiest without it. <laughs>
This famous story is played out again in any account of individuals who, by means of doubt, call into question the truths and values of their own culture. At first, when we were children, we lived in immediate harmony with family, culture, and society that surrounded us. But then, as we grow up, we reach a point where we naturally begin to question certain things that were taught when we were young. When we come to realize that our parents and our leaders are in fact fallible, this knowledge begins to alienate us from the world around us. Figures like Socrates, Faust, and Johannes Climacus doubted the fundamental things about their culture in the name of the search for knowledge. But this search alienated them from the world. Knowledge is a dangerous thing, and the defenders of traditional values and institutions fear it. But there is another perspective on this issue that comes from the Enlightenment. According to this view, human beings, as Aristotle says, by nature desire to know. Knowledge is what separates us from the animals is what makes human beings what they are. Our very humanity lies in our ability to think rationally and to examine our beliefs critically. As Socrates himself says, the unexamined life is not worth living. Due to the acquisition of knowledge, human beings have the ability to reshape their natural environment in order to make it more conducive to human life. Throughout all of history, human beings have struggled to improve things by means of their ability to acquire new knowledge. There have been great social advances when people realized that certain institutions were oppressive. For example, slavery was abolished. And basic human rights were enshrined in the constitutions and laws of different countries. There has also been great advances in many different fields of the sciences. And these advances have concretely improved the lives of people. For example, the elimination of diseases such as smallpox and polio, the advances in dentistry and anesthesiology, and one could go on and on with examples. The advocate of this view claims it would be completely absurd to try to deny these advances and that the entire weight of human history supports the famous adage that knowledge is power. According to this, anyone who wishes to try to suppress knowledge is blinded by a backward superstition. Who would want to repeal the idea of human rights? Who would want to go back to a day when there was no defense against disease or infection? Today, I suppose that most of us would probably side with the person representing this enlightenment view. But for this class, for example, we have thousands of online students from around the world. All of you have decided to take this course because you wanted to learn something about Soren Kierkegaard. You wanted new knowledge that uh, you didn't have before. You value knowledge and you believe that it's somehow important to have. Moreover, the very idea of these kinds of open online courses says that knowledge should be free and open to everyone and should not be the private domain of specific individuals, for example, in government or elite universities. Everyone should have the opportunity to learn and to acquire new knowledge. While this seems, on the face of it, to be very straightforward, our modern world renders this picture very problematic. It raises difficult questions that need careful consideration. While it's true that knowledge has brought us many things that have improved the lives of people around the globe, it's been a double-edged sword. It has also brought us terrible things. Knowledge and science has given us, for example, chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons that could 
potentially destroy all human life on the planet. World War I and World War II were fought with advanced weapons that cost the lives of millions. The Holocaust could never have taken place if it were not for the development of new technologies based on new knowledge. Today, we have major environmental problems such as global warming and the destruction of the ozone layer that are caused by the byproducts of human technology. Now, while it's true that knowledge and technology have helped us to improve our environment, they're also proving equally effective in destroying it. Even the question of the open access to knowledge, that is the fundamental premise behind our online course, even this question is not unproblematic. What does it mean to share knowledge? I can stand here and share with you some knowledge of the thought of Soren Kierkegaard, and this seems to be uh, yeah, quite straightforward, entirely unproblematic. But you can also go onto the internet and find people sharing knowledge about, for example, how to build a bomb. Right? This kind of knowledge makes all of us a bit uneasy. Should this be freely accessible to everyone? Should all countries in the world have the knowledge to produce nuclear weapons? Now, once human beings start out on this road to reason, science, and technology, there's no way back. It's a one-way street. Once people discover how to make a nuclear weapon, the genie is out of the bottle and can't be put back. As Kierkegaard says of his character, Johannes Climacus, once he begins to doubt, and once he starts this process, and becomes, he then becomes alienated from the world around him, then he can't return to his previous state of innocence. With considerations of this kind, we can begin to see the point behind the story of the fall in Genesis. The world east of Eden is a dangerous and uncomfortable one. Likewise, the stories of Socrates, Faust, and Johannes Climacus, they're not just tales from a distant past. On the contrary, they're the story of our perilous world in the 21st century.